Welcome and hello. I'm Nancy Cope, here to introduce you to a new program on HHTV called Writers Read. Linda and Paul Niebank have designed another chance for us to hear our friends read what they've been writing. And you already know what you might hear. A memoir, maybe a short story, or maybe a work in progress. In the past, these have been live performances or events. This time, of course, they're videotaped. Count on Horizon House to adapt and move forward. I'm going to read you this, the dates of these events. November 24th, 7 plus 7 is December 1st, December 8th, and December 15th. Now let's hear our readers tonight. A oh, welcome to another hour of writers reading their writing. These words, I just love these words, because we think of reading and writing as so important and an important part of our lives. Um, we want to say thanks to Linda and Paul and Risa. Risa has a t-shirt on today, and we've all seen it, and we loved it, because Risa is wearing the right t-shirt today. It says, a difference maker, Horizon House, and that is what she is. Thanks, Risa. <laughs> okay, today's readers are Marsha Iverson, Ann Ormsby, and Paul Niebank. Let's start with Paul's poem. You know how to do it. I say a line and you say a line. Yeah, cover your eyes, Paul, or your ears, either one. Here we go, right, right, right. Right, right, right. Until you get it right. Until you get it right. Then read aloud. Then read aloud. You'll draw a crowd. You'll draw a crowd. And give us great delight. Yes. And I, before we go on, I want to describe the crowd today. I don't know if you can tell where we are filming this. We're in the Forum and the Chapel, which allows six people plus eight people, which is 14 people. So the crowd that has been drawn together today is 14 people. <laughs> so. It's an enthusiastic 14, though, so enjoy. Marsha, so looking forward to hearing about your writing. The word memoir works for you, doesn't it? Yes, yes. And I like that word because the word memory is so close to the word memoir. I'll confess, I looked up your sheet your information sheet, and you know what Marsha says? She likes to look for humor in anything she can. <laughs> I thought that was a great thing to put on your interest sheet. Welcome, Marsha. We look forward to this. Thank you. It's a useful preamble. <laughs> I'll start with a visual aid. I used to do a lot of audiovisual work. This picture, I don't know if you can actually see it, is my mother, the baby, her sister, my aunt, and my grandmother. Now, the picture was taken about 1919. And keep those people in mind as I read. <laughs> Just across the Salt River from Tempe, Arizona was a farm. The sandy, meandering riverbed loosely defined its eastern side. Pastures and fields mark the south and western boundaries. U.S. Highway 60 sharply delineated the north edge, and a big patch of undulating terrain lay in between. Shaped by its desert environment, the most prominent landmark, most visible from town, was the hill, a stubborn outcrop of rock known as Caliche. The land itself shared strong similarities with the family that lived there. As the last living resident 
I hope these stories will capture the flavor of both as I remember them and share them with future generations. Caliche is a notorious type of loosely bound sedimentary desert conglomerate, a jumble of sand and rock fused together by calcium carbonate leaching. Not unlike the family, Caliche is hard, unforgiving, and various shades of beige. <laughs> to dig a hole in Caliche, you would first need a very good reason. Then you would need several days, more than one pickaxe, the patience of Job, the endurance of a marathon runner, and the physique of a 19-year-old bodybuilder. Alternatively, as my mother discovered, a slow soaker hose and a shovel would do the trick. When it is well saturated with water, Kalichi can be conquered with a trowel. Somehow the nature of the hill reflected its inhabitants, tough, stubborn, feisty, outwardly unforgiving, yet occasionally showing unexpected tenderness. How the farm came to be there in the desert is someone else's story. How the family came to be there is where my knowledge begins. My grandparents, Elijah Martin White and Laura Alice May Black, met and married in the high, cold, northeastern corner of California. Elijah was the only teacher in a one-room school, and Laura was his eldest pupil. They purchased the Arizona farm when the doctor prescribed a warmer climate if they wanted their eldest son to survive. They packed up their few goods, their first three boys, and moved to the Valley of the Sun, as the big flat basin in the middle of Arizona was called. The region was known as a good place to recuperate from chronic illness like tuberculosis. Family stories differ as to their selection of Tempe and their mode of travel. Elijah's father and elder brother already lived in the Phoenix area, which I'm sure was a factor. Evidently, Elijah liked the place enough or saw no efficient, no sufficient objection that he decided to stay. Family lore has it that Elijah and his father also moved 200 horses to the valley when they relocated. One uncle said they herded the horses all the way. Another asserts that the horses, and Elijah, traveled by train. If you have ever traveled between Alturas, California, and Phoenix, Arizona, you'll agree with me that the train seems the wiser, wiser choice. However, they traversed nearly a thousand miles. Elijah, Laura, and their boys moved to the farm in 1908. I don't think there was a formal name for it, but they called it the ranch or the home place. Predominantly a dairy farm, products included Holsteins, alfalfa to feed them, and cotton as a cash crop. For the first decade, the family lived in the previous owner's wooden shack with a dirt floor and a back house down the path. As the farm prospered, the family grew adding four more children over the next decade. Eventually, they built a real home in 1919. Relatively palatial, the elaborate structure of river rock and concrete, reinforced with iron rebar, became the focus of speculation for the townsfolk, giving the place an aura of elegance and mystery the family never claimed. Long gone, blasted to smithereens to clear space for a freeway. The house and the hill it sat on still generate local myths about its splendor and lamentations over its loss. As for elegance, I'll say that there was hot and cold running water in three spots indoors and electricity throughout. How they got the electrical service is a story of its own. The most luxurious feature was a large bathtub and wash basin right off the dining room, mm -hmm. tucked in the sloping space underneath the stairs. The kitchen also featured hot and cold running water, a gas range, and a refrigerator, the <clears throat> toilet, and another wash basin, were across the porch past the pantry in an isolation zone adjacent to but not accessible from the drive through garage. Various combinations of first and second generation offspring 
lived there until Elijah's death in 1963, and for a brief time after. All of this is prologue, setting the context for one-sided biographies of the ranch itself, those who were born and lived there, and their families. The extended white family included Elijah Martin, also known as E.M., Martin, Mart, or Papa, Laura Alice May, also known as Grandma, and seven surviving children, Garland, Elvin, Ervil, Walter, Laura Bell, Lily May, and Ralph. With spouses, the next generation included 13 grandchildren, and that's where I lose track. There are exponential numbers of great and great great grands and down the line, and I hope this narrative can bring us all together. You'll meet each of the nuclear family to the extent I knew them in future stories. My mother, Lily, yes, Lily White, her sister named her, was the sixth child, second daughter, third of four born on the ranch. Her mother was 45 when Lily was born and had grandchildren older than her own youngest children. My mom, dad, my favorite and only brother and I lived in a smaller rock and concrete house just up the hill from the big house. I held the most favored spot as the youngest girl of the youngest daughter of the resident crop of children. I had all the fun and none of the burden of family life. 200 acres to play on, whole steams, myriad irrigation ditches or water features as we saw them. Three homes were separated by an uneven natural landscape and a sparsely populated neighborhood of relatives who were there when we needed them, but not bothersome when we didn't. The family was both exceptional and ordinary, tempering a sense of adventure with the hard fact that their ancestors had little to lose by moving on. Just three generations span nearly 100 years between Elijah's birth and the arrival of the last grandchildren. But history didn't stop there. Elijah's father, Jilson Gallatin White, lived with the family toward the end of his long life. Born in 1842, he was my mother's living link to the Civil War. All were hard workers, farmers, orchardists, stonemasons, soldiers, teachers, secretaries, homemakers, and artisans. They were practical folk with a dream or two. Though none left a large footprint, achieved significant wealth, fame, or notoriety. A few landmarks built by Papa and Uncle Elvin remain, and countless orange, grapefruit, and lemon trees raised by Uncles Elvin, Ervil, Walter, and Ralph in their sister's nursery still bear silent witness. By the time I was old enough to appreciate the aunts, uncles, and cousins as individuals, most of them were gone one way or another. I knew best those who lived there in my day. Grandma, Papa, Uncle Ervil, and Aunt Agnes were my extended family. They were, in fact, so close, I hardly noticed we were separate. They were part of the air I breathed, the ground I played on, the backbreaking farm work I watched as a carefree spectator. They also were the best role models I knew for becoming a decent human being. When I sat down to write these stories of life on the ranch, I was surprised that Ervil and Agnes were the first to step forward. It seems only natural, they were there. They were reliable, tolerant, and kept their own counsel. Papa and Ervil weren't big talkers, and they were always out in the desert heat working. When Beg, Grandma would tell a few stories, but confined herself to the facts. No embellishment from her, and she died when I was six. In contrast, claiming credit for every measurable increment, Aunt Agnes lived to be 98 and two thirds. She was 46 when I was born, and old enough to cast a vote in the first election after the 19th Amendment secured her right. I knew her well in later years, when both of us were adults, and her stories shaped many of mine. 
When I learned to walk, they were there. When I was bored or lonely, they were there. When I skinned my knees or did things I shouldn't have, they were there. They were always there, within hollering distance, the defining limits of my free-range childhood. Last remaining member of the second generation, I left the ranch at 16. And not long after, in that sketchy time frame, teenagers view other people's lives, Ervil died of a heart attack during a row with an aggressive trespasser. His volatile temper did, indeed, jeopardize and finally claim his life. It was that very temper that led me as a child to steer clear of Ervil whenever possible. Perhaps my brother's knack for provoking our nearest uncle had something to do with my familiarity with his anger. Though I rarely, if ever, caught it firsthand, I was tainted with a certain degree of guilt by association. My brother Greg, four years older than I, and the only other child on the property, often led me astray. It wasn't hard. Our science experiments in the ancient barn, generating sparks by applying steel objects to the spinning, pedal-operated grinding wheel, surrounded by flammable materials in an old wooden barn, may have informed some of Uncle Ervil's volatility. Ervil was a compact, tough, wiry man, third son in the family of seven. Not born there, but he was raised, lived, worked, and died on the family farm. Hot-tempered, Ervil would burst into rage like a firecracker with an invisible fuse. He would yell, throw something, or reach for his belt, but the next minute he was over it. Unlike others, he never held a grudge. Though I never saw him hurt a soul, I usually avoided Ervil until I had a loose tooth. When faced with a child suffering from loose tooth anxiety, Uncle Ervil transformed into a surrogate Florence Nightingale, a gruff font of mercy and compassion. Whatever he was doing, from mending a fence to milking Holsteins, he would stop and give his full attention until he had resolved the problem. My first loose tooth came early, and I would rather have seen anyone else. Reassured by my big brother, I trudged along behind him as we set out on our quest to find Ervil. We knew he was somewhere on the ranch. He always was. We took the proximity path, checking likely sites as we passed. His house was closest, so we started there, to no avail. Then we set off across the railroad tracks, past the canal, to the dairy, where he might have been doing the afternoon milking, but it was too early. The milking shed was empty. At last, we checked the old barn and found him sharpening tools at that same big grinding wheel. He had already honed shiny new edges on his axe, a shovel, and the scythe. We discovered him in mid-garden hoe. A dull tool does nobody any good. He gave us a quizzical look, and we said in unison, what tooth? I wiggled the offending unit. I believe it was my upper right canine with my grimy little fingers. What could only be described as a sweet, gentle smile spread across his farmer tan. That's a two-tone tan where everything from the eyebrows on down is the color of a well-used baseball glove, and everything above the hat line remains a natural off-white. <laughs> he put down the hoe, stepped away from the grinding wheel, reached into his pocket, pulled out some floss I think he kept for the occasion, and beckoned me closer with a soft, let's have a look. With the scared, earnest anxiety of a new choir girl attempting a solo, I stepped forward and gave another demonstration of the tooth's wobbly state. He gently turned my head a couple of different directions to get a good look in better light, he said. <laughs> Anxiety rising and attempting the worst, I meekly followed his instruction, looked up toward the hayloft and opened wide. I may also have suspended my breath just in case. I felt a gentle busyness in the vicinity of my loose tooth, and then Ervil snapped his hands with a clapping sound, reminded me to breathe, put my now liberated tooth into the palm of my hand, and smiled a grin of radiant love. 
he may have tousled my hair. Then, lest I be overcome by his softness and begin to expect that as his normal demeanor, he advised with a twinkle in his eye that I didn't see until I was much older. Don't put your tongue where the tooth used to be or the new one won't grow in. <laughs> it was already far too late for that. <laughs> Some 40 years later, I asked Aunt Agnes how they met. Then 95 years old, widowed more than 30 years, Agnes replied with that same twinkle. It was given to me. I had to keep him and laughed the world's most beautiful laugh. But that's another story for another time. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow, wow. We were with you on that branch. We were with you losing a tooth. How many of you remember losing that tooth? <laughs> so, land, that was nice. Thank you, Marcia, so much. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure. Welcome to Ann Ormsby. Ann Ormsby has worn many, many hats here in Seattle and in Horizon House. But when re I was reading about her in our HH Connect information, I loved that she put under interests and experiences, she put learning. Mm -hmm. And I thought that you put learning right. under yes. interests and experiences. Yes. Then she put under memberships, numerous. <laughs> and then awards, you put assorted. <laughs> I just love the word choice. <laughs> Thank you for reading for us today, Anne. Thank you for having me here. And I have a very short piece. I started writing when I came to Horizon House, and Peggy Sturdivant was teaching writing classes in the Dunbar room. Um, Peggy, well, Sturdivant is my maiden name, so I was doubly attracted. Her husband has that name. All of our ancestors came from way back when and were on the uh, Mayflower and things like that, but I will not bore you with those details. I live in the West Wing at the very end, and I have windows on three sides of, of my apartment. I am one of very lucky people. I walked into Verizon House ready to move in when my apartment was totally down to the studs because somebody had lived there for four years. And I said, I'll take it. Um, there was a little hesitation as apparently another family was interested. And so I said, what does it mean to be number one on the waiting list? <laughs> and I had a phone call that afternoon that the apartment was mine. So anyway. I love living here. And I love the writing classes. Peggy insisted on one page stories because uh, there were enough people in the writing class that we were all going to write something and read it in the class. We needed to keep them short so everybody would have an opportunity. So this is called It Was Green. From my living room windows, I have an expansive view of the east side of Freeway Park from the Convention Center to the north and Seneca Street on the south. Trees within the park create a soft frame for the hard-edged buildings to the west and to the north. Sometimes the park is filled with people. At least twice a year, the people are creatively costumed for Comic-Con. Not this year. Recently, um, thousands of business attire, men and women, attending a digital information conference, all carrying brown bags, sat on the lawn to converse and eat whatever was in the bags. Daily, people walking dogs circled the park. The dogs most often are on leash, 
all are encouraged to relieve themselves either on the lawn or in the surrounding bushes. Sometimes the dogs are free to play catch. Dog walkers with three or more dogs on leashes briskly exercise their charges. Up until the last month, every park ground cover, plant, and tree has been healthy and resplendent in its seasonal color variations. The 100-foot Douglas fir, just feet from my north-facing windows, was alive with squirrels feeding on pine cones and varieties of birds including seagulls, crows, and pigeons that seemed to stop for a rest or to feed on insects and seeds before flying west toward the Sound or east to Lake Washington. This fur has one anomaly. At some time in its youth, it has been inexpertly pruned. As a result, instead of a single trunk to its top, a second trunk had trunk had developed starting about one-third of its height above the ground. Since mid-April, this near and dear fur has changed from healthy to looking peaky, and then by early May, totally rust-colored and dead. I suspect that debris collected in the trunk crotch rotted the trunk and killed the tree. No squirrels visit the tree. Birds avoid it. It is lifeless, dead. The park lawn has also changed. What used to be lush and wide green swaths are now brown and unappealing. Many folk walk through each day. Few are stopping to sit a while. Several from Horizon House, including our then CEO, Sarah, had spoken to park personnel. The response to our concerns are, the responses to our concerns are that the tree removal has been expedited. It is promised to be removed by September. This was in April, I think. The convention center has plans to expand to the north and we will be required to mitigate the effects of that expansion. There is talk that the mitigation will include park expansion. Perhaps the parks board has decided to pause park maintenance until convention center expansions mitigations are complete. That's a number of years down the road. I am impressed how the death of the tree has weighed on me. I have no control over its life disposition, and maybe only slightly more over mine. Wow. You've given us a gift, and you know what I thought of while you were reading? I said, next spring, we need to get a freeway park reading group together, and every person would go find something about freeway park to write about. Mm -hmm. What do you say, Paul? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Ann. Thank you for listening and for the opportunity. Hi, Hi, Paul. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Honey, I have a chance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have to do this, because you notice what I'm holding close. Yes, I do. <laughs> May I go outside while you introduce me? No. You need to sit right here and listen to Nancy. <laughs> Everybody say these two words. Begin again. Begin again. I just love two words that can say so much. Begin Again is Paul Niebank's new book. And it is a delight. He has given this copy to the library. Inside it says, 
Horizon House Library, and he signed Paul. So starting, when is it, Ellen? Our next book exchange is Tuesday. What are we, Friday? Next Tuesday, this will be in the book exchange room, and you can borrow it. Oh. And so it's starting to make the rounds fall. But before I go, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, first of all, for your musical self. Thank you for your word self. Thank you for your humorous self. And last but not least, thank you for your caring self. Welcome, Paul. My, my. I have a love story, and it's also a success story. You will see what I mean by both as I read it to you. The story is called My Boys and Me. My Boys and Me. I have been out of high school for eight years, scrounging for work across the country in one low-level industrial job after another. I've accumulated two and a half years of college present credits along the way. I've learned a lot, but I don't have much to show for it. Now I'm working at the Chevrolet assembly plant in Terrytown, and I'm living at the YMCA. I'm getting my kicks as a volunteer in the youth division of the Y. The General Secretary, Art Connell, has given me a free hand. So besides running the mimeograph machine, loading the Coke machine, and playing checkers with the loneliest kids, I'm inventing a few things for the boys and girls to do. Art approves of what I'm doing, and when suddenly the youth secretary and the phys ed secretary decide to leave for better jobs, better paying jobs elsewhere, he sees an opportunity that will save him money. How about you're taking both jobs, Paul, he asks, and I snap up his offer. He pays me less than half of, the, of either of the job uh, professionals who had succeeded me. Getting paid for what I do naturally gives me a chance to invent all manner of new programs. A summer day camp, a church league and basketball and boring, bowling, a Friday night roller skate party for preteens, and a Saturday night dance for teenage kids. Before we know it, the Y is bursting at the seams with popular activities. All well and good, and the statewide youth secretary, Howard Shin, takes notice. But he cautions me that in order to advance myself, I've got to finish my undergraduate work and get professionally certified. That's sobering news. I asked Mr. Shin to give me permission to apply for just one more YMCA job. He agrees and I look at the postings for youth work in the greater New York City region. One of them is in Flatbush, Brooklyn. I like how the job sounds, and I share my interest with Mr. Shin. He says yes, but he has another caution. Quote, that branch of the Y has no facilities of its own, Paul, and no history with any staff except for the general secretary you'd be pretty much on your own. A little does Mr. Shin know that that's just the kind of challenge I like. I apply for the job, I get it, and I make the move. Most of my work in Flatbush is with high-wise service clubs, girls and boys from Midwood and Erasmus Hall high schools. There are six clubs and they meet in the evening. But I also work with young boys in the after, after school hours. I'm constantly figuring out how to entertain these boys 
and tutor them at the same time. I like them, and I know from experience that the Y is a place where they can be affirmed. The boys and I play board games, card games, table tennis, shuffleboard. We do crafts projects with materials of various sorts. Now and then we do community service, trash pickup, playground assistance, hospital visits. But I want more for them. I want something memorable, something they can be proud of, something that they can brag about. Hey, do any of you fellas know how to swim? None of the boys raises his hand or speaks up. That's what I figured. These are city kids. Some of them may not ever have been more than six months, six blocks from home. Anybody been to Coney Island? Three boys nod. There's water there. We went for the rides. Okay, how about I teach you to swim? Then you can go to Coney Island and play in the surf. Yeah, sure. Wow, cool. I have taken a risk. All we have here is the second floor of the big grocery store. That's all the Y can afford. But the downtown Brooklyn branch has a huge natatorium. I will need downtown to have a spot open on the pool schedule. I call them and who? Thursday, four to five is open, fall quarter. I called just in time for them to fit in a 10 week session before the holidays. Day after tomorrow, I tell the dozen boys who have signed up, I'm almost giddy. I taught a life saving class to high school girls last spring in Terrytown. I can't wait to get back in the water again. As the boys sign up and head for home, I call after them. Come here right after school, bring your bathing suit, and if you don't have one, buy one. And if you can't afford it, tell me and I'll spot you. We hustle over to the subway it's just half a buck away, and scramble down the stairs. Drop your suits in my tote bag. Everybody in the front car where the conductor can see us. <laughs> Stay together now, light on your feet. Make sure that you're touching the shoulder of the guy next to you. In the train were a bunch of mice, or maybe puppy dogs, wriggling and bumping. I, I poke my nose around to make sure that everyone is accounted for. At the downtown platform, I brief the boys on what to expect when we get to the pool. Three rules, I tell them. One, keep still. Your voices will reverberate in the big empty space. Two, go slowly. Don't get ahead of my instructions. Three. Memorize the sequence and always begin at the beginning. Now we're out of the subway into the huge old granite ornate YMCA. We change in the boys' locker room, and wow, the natatorium is big enough to call cavernous. And the boys do keep still, probably out as, as much out of awe as because I gave them an order. We take a minute to look around. The Olympic-sized pool, the wide apron, the hot pool, the viewing stands, and especially the height. It's at least three stories, with big windows at the top. I breathe in the familiar damp air with its hint of chlorine. These boys will fall in love with the feel of an indoor pool. Everybody in the pool, stand along the shallow end, I say, and I slide in myself. Eddie and Simon won't go in. 
So I did a shivering. I bring a stack of towels to the pool's edge and wrap one around it. You two sit on the edge, okay? They do, but gingerly. Simon won't let his feet touch the water. Slowly, 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 rest your hands on the edge. Take one step backward. Let your face fall toward the water. And if you feel like it, hold your breath and let your face fall into the water. And if you feel like it, let your eyes stay open. When you're ready, stand up straight again and shake off the water. Then do it again, slowly, slowly. I make my way across the pool behind each of the boys, making hardly a ripple, noticing each boy's actions, each boy's hesitations. So it goes, lesson after lesson, step by step, each boy doing what he's ready to do, and all of them learning the same basics, step by step. We take a pause during the week five lesson. I ask each of the boys to show his pals whatever he wants to show. Bruce can kick himself all the way across without taking a breath. Mike can go across on his back. Eddie has discovered his inner courage. He can actually do a breaststroke, although he doesn't put his face in the water yet. Matt has mastered the dead man's float. He loves it. I have to keep an eye lest he float into the deep end. Jake is a joker. He does a wild butterfly back and forth. It's a jolly moment. Even Simon gets into the act. He asks each boy to whisper to him what the boy is going to do. Then he announces it as though it's an actual performance. He still won't go into the water himself, though. He's harboring a lot of fear. I haven't let any of the boys swim the length of the pool yet. There are plenty of sub subtleties to learn, and I keep to the rules. No talking, take one thing at a time, and repeat the rudiments until they become routine. I tell them, you've heard that practice makes perfect. Okay, a perfect practice is the real secret. Mm -hmm. The ride home is happiness all around, from Borough Hall to Atlantic Avenue, then Franklin Winter Church, 15 stops to Flatbush Avenue, I am sky high with admiration for these young boys. Back at the Y, there's a call waiting for me on my phone. As a new employee of the New York City YMCA, I'm required to take a battery of tests. I ask my boss to cover for me on Monday and Tuesday, and I make my way to the YMCA headquarters, which is in Midtown Manhattan. The test assessor, Rosemary Bruff, sets me up, and for most of the next two days, I'm absorbed in aptitude tests, interest tests, intelligence tests, personality tests. I enjoy them. I've always liked taking tests. Friday takes me back to headquarters for my assessment. Ms. Bruff invites me into her office. It's a dark office, and it gives me the willies. Ms. Bruff makes no gesture for me to sit down. Instead, she looks me over as though she's studying me. She, wait, she waits. I wait. Finally, I brighten up. I'm going to finish college, I say. She smiles broadly. We shake hands. That's that. Week 10 comes, it's time for the boys to show off. Parents come, uncles, aunts, grandparents, friends. Everyone is quiet and expectant waiting. Simon, he 
has no idea what I'm going to ask of him. Show everyone how you can jump into the pool. I'm here to catch you before your feet hit the bottom. Simon heaves himself at me. The other boys clap, and everybody in the stands clap as well. Simon beams. I set him on the apron. He splashes his feet in the water. He wiggles his toes. He giggles. When things settle down, I whisper to Simon that it's time for him to MC the performance. He hops up, wraps a towel around in his own shoulders. I hand him a megaphone. Simon introduces each boy by name and announces the feat that that boy will demonstrate. One by one, each boy performs an aspect of the program that he has mastered. Jake goes last. Simon speaks slowly into the megaphone. Now, and for all time, is the culmination of our incredible program. Jake Bourdain is our last performer. Please take note that this is an Olympic class swimming pool. Watch closely. Jake will swim freestyle from the shallow end to the deep end of the pool, where he will turn around and swim back to the shallow end, all with the class of an Olympic swimmer. Now it's early December. I pay a call on Wilson Schaffer, the undergraduate dean of the university. My reason for asking to see you is that I would like to be readmitted. As far as I'm concerned, Paul, you never left, he says. We sit down right there and then and work out a study plan that will graduate me a year from the coming spring. When I tell the kids in Flatbush that I'm going back to school, they're sad, but they're delighted. You're doing the right thing. You're setting a good example. Be sure to come back and tell us how it goes. The teen kids take me to Coney Island as a going away present. We do some of the rides and games. We bump each other with the bumper cars. And we do a lot of hugging. My afternoon boys take me to Prospect Park. There they run around and do what young boys do. Touch football, hide and seek. I won't remember the details. I will remember the feeling of the bond that has formed among us and how happy they are. In January, I'm back in school. This is where I belong now. I'm studying hard and I'm doing well. I'll go back to Flatbush at spring recess. I'll tell the boys that I'm swimming both lengths in a pool, Olympic class. <laughs> Oh, what a gift that brought back so many, many memories. Oh, I thank you for sharing that story. And I thank you for your book, Begin Again. I keep thinking of different ways during the day I can use that phrase. Nancy, begin again. Thank you, Paul. Okay, what another rich hour of listening to writers read. Thank you to Marsha, thank you to Anne, and thank you, Paul. We will continue, I hope, in some way soon. Thank you one and all for coming. Thank you. You have just heard three readers 
of the 50 readers who have read and shared their writing with us since 2018. Ina Bray had this idea that writers should share what they've written by reading their writing. I'd like to share with you the 50 people who have shared. John Longris, Bernice Kastner, Peter Elbow, Grant Hildebrand, Judy Brown, Donald Meyer, Artis Palmer, Jean Durning, Simon Ottenberg, Anne-Marie Godston, Joan Singler, Urban Saracen, Phyllis Van Orton, Beth Davis, Bob Fitzgerald, Melissa Fall, Estella Leopold, David Gucci, Brace Popoff, Jean Carlson, Audrey Whitecamp, Phyllis Lamphere, Marianne Anderson, Bill Anderson, Carol Ottenberg, Red McVitty, Barbara Ray, Ina Bray, John Clement, Gordon Oriens, Jane Hastings, Jesse Attree, Nancy Rust, Peter Corning, Paul Niebank, Ray Tufts, Abe Bergman, Lee Scheingold, Maid Adams, Sue Lynch, Pat Decker, Ann Ormsby, Norman Hirsch, Ann Pound, Bill Stark, Marsha Iverson, Bob Corwin, Cassandra Carruthers, and Mary Piet. What an amazing time we've had with all of you, and thank you all for sharing with us.